There are many convincing arguments to support us providing many different species of reptile with UVB. For example, we know for a fact that leopard geckos are able to synthesise vitamin D3 when exposed to the appropriate UVB radiation, and therefore we do have very good cause to provide them with this radiation in captivity. The majority of cases simply aren't as clear cut as this, because people haven't had the time or occasion to go round testing all of the thousands of species of reptiles for these sorts of interactions. So, for example, we simply don't know yet whether Mexican black king snakes are able to synthesise vitamin D3 in response to UVB radiation. So, should we provide them with it, or shouldn't we? One argument for still using UVB in these situations, which is written up in an article that I will leave linked in the description, is that many different types of vertebrates have been proven to have positive interaction with UVB. So, for example, mammals, amphibians, and of particular importance to us, birds. But what has birds interacting with UVB got to do with reptiles like snakes doing the same? Seemingly not very much. To understand why this argument is so relevant, we're going to have to dive into some taxonomy and cladistics. Each of the branch points on a phylogenetic tree represents a speciation event. A speciation event being where a common ancestor produces offspring which will never again be part of the same breeding stock. Now if you spend a great deal of time thinking about that, it might not actually always make sense. But stick with it for now and let's zoom out and things should start to become clear. A very simple phylogenetic tree could be this, where each letter represents a species alive today. The further towards the tip of the tree that a branch point lies, the more recent the speciation event that it represents must have occurred. Before a given branch point in time, all of the species that are presently classed as being distinct must have been a member of the same species, or in other terms they must have been part of the population to which all of their common ancestors belonged. What this means is that species A and species B were a member of the same species more recently than either was a member of the same species with C. Consequently, we are able to say that A and B are more closely related to each other than either is to C, and in fact, each A and B are equally closely related to C. Now if that doesn't quite make sense, here's a real world example for you. Approximately 1.6 million years ago, it is believed that the bonobo and chimpanzee last shared a common ancestor. About 6 million years ago, they both then shared their last common ancestor with, well, human beings. So, looking at our tree, we are able to say that chimps and bonobos are more closely related to each other than either is to human beings, with chimps and bonobos being equally closely related to human beings. Simple enough, right? We can, of course, go back in time to the next speciation event, which in this case is with the gorillas. Once again, an examination of the tree reveals that chimps, bonobos and human beings are all more closely related to each other than any of the three is to gorillas, and likewise, the eastern and western gorillas are more closely related to each other than either of them is to humans, chimps or bonobos. But it doesn't have to stop there, because we can keep going back and back and back, and indeed we can start with any group of species, so we could start with chameleons, or we could start with daffodils, or a bacteria or whatever you fancy. But the thing is, as you go back to one speciation event, and then back again and back again, you end up joining up with more and more species that are alive today, with the ultimate goal being to produce a tree that categorises accurately all of the speciation events that have produced all of the species that we know and love today. But how do we work out which species are more closely related to each other than they are to others. Traditional taxonomy involves looking at the outward appearances of different species and assigning them to categories that relate to the relationship between these different organisms. So, traditionally, crocodilians, chelonians, amphisbenians, snakes, lizards and chihuahuas were all lumped together in the category reptilia, or the reptiles, because they all look fairly similar to each other and behave fairly similarly to each other, so it was assumed that they must all be more closely related to each other than any of them is to any other species. Similar morphological analyses of the vertebrate species produced a phylogenetic tree that looked a bit like this, with fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals all taking up their own little bit of branch on the tree. But now that we're able to perform molecular as well as morphological analyses, we're actually able to reconstruct our tree to make it much more accurate. 
And this is where things get interesting. As it turns out, birds appear to be more closely related to crocodilians than to any other group of organisms. And then after that, they are next most closely related to Chelonians, and following on from that, the next speciation event is with the rest of the traditional reptiles. So really, reptiles and birds aren't separate at all, as you can split the reptiles into two major groups, being birds, crocodilians and chelonians in one group, and then snakes, lizards, amphisbenians and chihuahuas in the other. So that means that if the term reptile is going to refer to any species which is a descendant from the last common ancestor of lizards, snakes, amphisbenians, chihuahuas, chelonians and crocodilians, then birds are reptiles too. Now, I'm sure that you'll agree with me when I say that to change the definition of the word reptile now would be a little bit unnecessarily complicated because, you know, when I say reptile, you know that I mean one of those exothermic, scaly, wingless buggers and not one of them little fluffy things. So if we want to reserve the name reptile for this purpose, then we need to understand that it doesn't actually mean anything in terms of our phylogenetic tree of life. A name like this is what we call a grade, with the alternative, i.e. a name that refers to all of the descendants of a common ancestor, being called a clade. In this instance, the clade is called sauropsida, meaning that birds are sauropsids just as much as snakes or lizards are. So not mentioning fish for the rest of this video, because if I told you the truth about those, it might just play with your head a little bit too much. Uh, if we zoom out and have a look at our phylogenetic tree of vertebrates, we see that whereas before there were four major clades, there are now only three. So what on earth has any of that got to do with reptiles needing UVB? Well, let me introduce you, good sir, to my dear friend, William of Ockham. Now, I won't go into the history of it, but basically, there is a principle known as Ockham's Razor, which states that if there are two hypotheses or ideas, then the one that we should choose to believe is the one that involves the least amount of assumption. Now, a big part of the argument in suggesting that all captive reptiles should be provided with UVB radiation is that lots of species around the vertebrate family tree are known to have positive interactions with UVB namely vitamin D3 synthesis. So how do we explain this observation? Well, in my mind, there are only really two ideas to choose between. Either that the common ancestor of all of the vertebrate species shown on this family tree did have some capacity to synthesize vitamin D3 in response to ultraviolet radiation. So basically, for this idea, we have to make one single assumption which cannot be proven, as far as I'm aware, and that is that the common ancestor to all of these species did synthesize vitamin D3 in response to UVB. The alternative explanation is that each of the branches on this part of the tree evolved the same ability to synthesize vitamin D3 in response to UVB separately. So branches on the mammal tree did it separately to branches on the bird tree, did it separately to branches on the wider reptile tree, including the birds of course, and did it then again separately to amphibians on their part of the tree. And obviously, this involves a lot more assumption than the first idea, and so according to Wacom's Razor, we should select the first idea. If our idea of conserved function is correct, then we have to make the baseline assumption that when we come across a species within this part of the family tree that we do not know if it synthesizes D3 in response to UVB, then once again, our baseline assumption has got to be that it does. So when you come across a Mexican black king snake basking in ultraviolet B radiation, your safest, best bet is that it is synthesizing vitamin D3, even though we maybe don't have categoric evidence to prove it. So to generalize, we should probably be offering ultraviolet B exposure to all of the vertebrate species that we keep in captivity, be they reptiles or otherwise, and whether we have evidence to prove that they have positive interactions with UVB or not. Provided that you don't over irradiate an animal, there's not really any bad that can come from this, but there is a lot of good. And that is my take on this matter. Now I'm having all sorts of technological issues at the minute and this microphone's like packing in, so I'm going to wrap this video up here. 
I hope that you did enjoy it and if you did you will subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss out on another upload because I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.